Um, thanks a lot. Uh, I want to just say um, a couple of uh, quick remarks about this topic. Uh, Ivan was the first um, person I worked with intensively in coming into linguistics. I didn't do linguistics before graduate school here. Um, and uh, the very first paper topic that I worked on was with you on the internal structure of coordinate categories. And it's something that I, it's some, you know, in the, these days I've gone on to do probabilistic grammars, um, but uh, I come back to this topic every once in a while and I like to think about, I, I feel like I'm trying to get it, get it right and get it right, what I'm thinking of saying, and hopefully I'll be a little closer this time. Um, so the, uh, the first thing I want to start with is, this is what I need, um, a few hallmark principles of the Saab tradition of grammatical analysis, which really, I think, um, really go beyond, um, whoops, immediately to the right. Just close it, okay, thanks. Um, immediately, uh, so uh, the, uh, a couple of hallmark principles that I think transcend any particular grammatical formalism or tra tradition, uh, they're long lessons that I have learned uh, and, and keep with me from working with Ivan. Um, the first is that it's essential, it's really worth it to formalize. It's essential to state formal claims about the nature of grammar, your commitments precisely. The second one is that, um, and I think this is something that Philip mentioned le yesterday, we really have to seriously engage with the full range of distributional generalizations in one's data. You can't just shove some data under the carpet and be doing the science of language properly. And the third is at the same time, while we're, um, while we're engaging with a full range of distributional generalizations, we also have to be rigorous in credit assignment. That is, in determining when to associate, when to give credit to the grammar for a particular gen distributional generalization, and when to say, no, there's actually another source of that distributional generalization. So proper credit assignment is another part of the scientific enterprise of studying language. Um, and the, the, the uh, moral, which I think that all of you already know, is that when you do this correctly, these principles are very powerful in identifying both grammatical knowledge and its <coughs> interface with the rest of cognition. So with that, I want to dive into the internal structure of coordinate categories. I think you're all familiar with the, um, the principle of conjoins likes, which dates back to the very beginning of transformational um, and generative grammar. The idea is that what it means to a coordination is combining some category X with another category X. Now, um, the, all, the rub for categorical theories of grammar has always been what does X mean? And the, uh, the original interpretation of this was, well, it's something like major syntactic categories, noun phrase, for example, adjective phrase. So a coordination might be of a noun phrase with a noun phrase. Well, Ivan showed this very clearly to be false, um, uh, best known in the 85 paper uh, with this famous sentence, Pat is a Republican and proud of it, the coordination of a noun phrase and an adjective phrase. But it turns out that even beyond the level of gross syntactic category, this principle is false. So for example, for the, um, the case value of, uh, a, of a phrase, um, there is a number of pieces of work on this. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, in work that um, Ivan was supervising to, uh, to notice that um, cases in Slavic where you can have, for example, a verb that disjunctively specifies a um, constraint of either accusative or genitive case on its noun phrase, on its noun phrase object. And then actually under that circumstance, you can actually conjoin Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, that's right. You can actually conjoin an accusative and a genitive noun phrase. So there's no constraint that the case actually be the same for the two noun phrases. Um, that is that the generalization about the categorical structure of coordination is that a coordination is co categorically grammatical if and only if it satisfies all the extrinsic constraints on its well-formedness. And many, many authors um, have done, uh, done work to, uh, to formalize this idea, and I think I even summarized it. Uh, the, uh, the ideas and sort of really captured them and distilled them out very well in his 2003 paper. Um, but that leaves the question, well, what about, what was the nature of conjoins likes? Was conjoins likes just wrong? Is there any, anything left for grammar to say about a tendency for like things to coordinate? Or is, is, is there nothing to say grammatically about coordination? Well, um, I, at the time that I was studying this, this was also the time the corpus analysis was taking off at Stanford. And, um, it turns out unlikely category, unlike category coordinations are very easy to find if you're looking the right way in corpora. So this is an example from the Brown corpus. His hunt had been friendly, a big fellow of 50 or more, and then a fishing boat captain and powerful like the sea. Noun phrase and adjective phrase. Very clear example. So you can find these examples. On the other hand, there's a huge quantitative tendency for coordination to be of like categories. And this is true of any corpus that you'll look at, I think, pretty much. Um, it's weaker in some, stronger in others, but uh, you know, so noun phrases almost always, when they coordinate, they uh, co coordinate, coordinate with noun phrases, adjective phrases, likewise, almost always coordinate with adjective phrases. Um, so it's tempting to claim, and I'm going to um, make reference to Philip's talk um, earlier today, that um, 
This pattern illustrates what we might want to call a soft constraint towards conjoined likes. That although there is no categorical constraint that conjoined likes is a preference, it is a soft preference. But I want to now um, go back to the original principles um, that, with, that I mentioned at the outset, which is rigorous credit assignment. Should we actually really attribute this to the grammar proper? Um, and this question, I think, illustrates a critical difference that I think as we move into, uh, as linguistics continues to move into an era of um, empirical, data-driven, quantitative work, that there's a critical difference which I think everybody realizes implicitly, and I'm just trying to state it explicitly, between the nature of evidence for probabilistic versus categorical theories. And um, Jeff's example from yesterday, I think, illustrates this extremely well. In categorical theories, the possibility of a string regardless of the extra linguistic circumstances that are required to make it possible, is sufficient for your grammar to be held accountable for that string. Okay, so the currency is the possibility of a string and the possibility of interpretation. This is not the case in probabilistic or gradient theories. In those theories, the data currency is relative prevalence of different kinds of structures, and one has to do a lot of work to carefully disentangle the contributions of grammar and extra linguistic circumstances. Um, and uh, here's just a simple illustration of how one might be we need to treat this um, evidence for uh, con soft conjoined likes very carefully. So suppose that X goes to Y and Z, where Y and Z could be two different categories, um, and uh, that this occurs, you see, you have a corpus which is a mixture of three different circumstances. In one case, you have, you have a bunch of coordinated phrases which are objects of transitive verbs, and, it, and this is, of course, a case where you're going to get noun phrases. You're going to get coordinated noun phrases. Here you have a case, a copula, that can support a mixture of different coordinated categories. Here you have a case where you're probably going to get a lot of coordinated adjective phrases inside a noun phrase. Well, if your corpus is, if your data sample is in a mixture of all three of these things, you're going to have NPs and NPs, an uncorrelated, potentially, mixture of different categories, and adjective phrases and adjective phrases, you're going to see, on average, a tendency for conjoined likes. Because even if this is an uncorrelated mixture, when you mix these two things in, it's going to create a correlation. And so this is a problem that one has to be very careful about. Um, a credit assignment is really, if, if we find such a soft tendency, as I illustrated with corpus data, what should we be attributing it to? Um, and now I'm going to make a big segue into what are the, into this, now I'm going to go back to the question of formalization. So what are the kinds of formal techniques that we want to actually talk about this problem of credit assignment, and even to talk precisely about in the era of quantitative, um, quantitative approaches to language knowledge, what does it mean to have, um, to have a quantitative grammatical constraint, a probabilistic constraint, a soft constraint. And um, I want to use the, this is my one minute introduction to Bayesnets. Um, many of you may be familiar with this already. Um, this is not an expressive formal, enough formalism to capture all of the things we want to do with syntax, but it's enough to do the critical little bits for um, today. I think it illustrates a couple of things very nice. So Bayesnets are directed asymptographical models. Um, this is a simple famous example where, for example, a burglar alarm at your house could be triggered by an earthquake going off or a burglary, alternatively. And it also, you might be connected to your cell phone so that you get a call when your alarm goes off. And there are a bunch of questions that one can ask. For example, if you get a phone call, does that make it more likely that there was an earthquake, even if you didn't notice it? The answer is, of course, yes. Um, if it makes, if, uh, if, uh, uh, if, uh, you, if there's an earthquake, does it affect your uh, beliefs about burglaries? Intuitively, no, but actually the situations are dependent. So uh, it depends on the situation. So, the two critical bits of knowledge in a Bayesnet are that traditional probabilistic conditional independencies are specified by it. That is that if you, get, if you want to know whether x and y are independent given known variables, you ask the question whether every path between x and y is blocked by an unknown variable with converging arrows. So for example, are earthquake and burglary independent of each other? Well, this is the path between them. It's blocked by a variable. If you don't know there's a burglary alarm, then um, if you don't know what the, the, whether the, your alarm went off, then yes, these are independent. But if you know that the alarm went off, you get an explaining away phenomenon. That is that if you know that there was an earthquake, it makes you less worried about whether there was a burglary at your house, right? Um, the second possible situation is whether a known variable um, intervenes without converging rows. So the fact that you got a phone call doesn't, doesn't affect your beliefs about earthquakes if you already knew that your burglar early alarm went off. On the other hand, if you didn't know that your burglar alarm went off, then it would affect your beliefs. A phone call would make you worry about an earthquake. The second thing that the Bayesnet specifies is the basic units of probabilistic knowledge. That is that what you need to know about the world to specify uh, the details of this probabilistic model is the probabilities of each child node given the immediate parents. So to know them, this model, is to know the conditional distribution of how likely is the alarm to go off given an earthquake and all 
different possible combinations of earthquake and burglary. Likewise, how likely is your phone to ring when there's an alarm? That is the knowledge that you need to know. Applying this to um, the principle of conjoins likes. So here's the situation that I want to outline. Um, this is a little base net. Um, there's meanings, M1 and M2, of individual conjuncts. And there's forms, F1 and F2, of individual conjuncts. So that is that, think of M1 and M2 as the intended conjunct meanings and also the extrinsic constraints that are applying it to it. The forms are the individual forms of the, of the, uh, of the conjuncts that they take, and the ordering is the ordering that's realized. Now, what, what I'm going to claim is that what it is to know uh, your pro uh, probabilistic knowledge of, um, of actually uh, of, of coordination is to know what different meanings are likely to be realized as in terms of forms and how two realized forms are good, likely to be ordered given also what they mean. Um, the blue arrows that I'm going to mention here are um, the order of them does not matter in this model, but the order of the other ones does. Um, and the question of conjoins likes is really whether there's an arrow connecting the two forms. That is, is the prob probability of one form, is it dependent on the, other prob the probability of the other form if you know already the meaning of the form that's supposed to be realized? And this actually illustrates, okay, and, and so what does this mean, gradient coordination of like categories? More precisely, we want to know whether this distribution, whether the joint distribution over forms is especially high when the forms are similar to each other in a traditional sense, and fully technically we could formalize this as mutual information if we want. Um, and we could say that the higher the, um, the basically like the, the more similar these categories are, um, uh, that the mutual information between these things should be increasing as the structural similarity of the forms increases. But this is conditional on knowledge of the meanings. And this actually reveals the limitation of the corpus analysis before, which is that these variables were unknown. Because of that, these two things were in, even it, without this, these two things were indirectly connected by this chain. That is, that they were not independent from one another. So finding out that two forms are correlated in being similar to each other could have been explained away by correlations in the kind of meanings that want to be expressed. So for example, two different, uh, so nouns tend to have more similar meanings to each other than adjectives tend to have, and so forth. Likewise with external constraints, as is in the example that I gave before. This model does make, however, empirical predictions. That is, if we can hold the meanings constant, and if it's the case that really that this holds, gradient coordination of like categories is an actual property of language, that then the more gradiently, more gra and, if, and if people judge, quote unquote, more probable forms as to be, to be more grammatical, then like category coordination should be judged to be more natural or acceptable than unlikely, unlike category coordinations. This leads to an experimental design uh, inspired by the SOG 1885 classic example. Rather than pat as a Republican, however, we need to use forms that could easily either be realized as adjective phrases or as noun phrases. Instead of pat as a Republican and proud of it, well, proud of it is hard to realize as a noun phrase. Pat as a Republican and a freak is a little better. <laughs> pat as a Republican and a freak, noun phrase, noun phrase. Pat as a Republican and freaky, noun phrase, uh, adjective phrase. Pat is Republican, adjective phrase, and a freak. Pat is Republican and freaky. And we can ask, so what's the pattern? It turns out there is an interactive pattern such that combinations of two nouns and two adjectives are better than unlike category coordinations. So the gradient pr pr preference for coordination of unlike categories is pretty strong. But now I ask you this. We already saw that conjoin the likes is categorically false, but probabilistically true. But why stop there? Why, go, why, not stop, why stop at the major syntactic categories? Why not go farther down? What about category internal structure? And under the rubric of parallelism, which you heard about earlier today, um, this has actually been explored before under, by other researchers. Um, but I, 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 we're going to actually discover something interesting about the nature of parallelism in the next minute and a half. So here are example, here's an example of a case where we can hold meanings relatively constant and manipulate degree of NP internal parallelism post-nominal versus pre-nominal realization of the genitive. The future of our country, our country's future, the base of the lamp, the lamp's base, the tail of a cat, a cat's tail. There's a, there is also a strong preference in cor the strong tendency in corpora for there to be, um, for there to be uh, parallelism at this level. That is, you're more likely to have two post-nominals or two pre-nominals than anything else. But once again, this is, does not, the corpus analysis does not control for the meaning component of this. But we can do this with an experiment where we hold the meanings precisely the same, frame of the chair, base of the lamp, chair's frame, lamp's base. It turns out there's also a preference for, the parallelism, for parallelism in the genitive alternation. 
Yeah, that is that the two best forms are, um, are the postnominal postnominal and the prenominal prenominal form. Um, however, we can also use the, 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 the principle of quantifying the size of an interaction from experimental psychology and ask how big is the interaction in these two cases? And the answer is that the conjoins likes preference is stronger than the genitive parallelism interaction. That is, as you dig farther down inside the coordinate, the categories, the, preferen the parallelism preference, the likeness preference is still there, it just gets weaker. So overall, grammar has very little to say, I've concluded, about categorical constraints on the relations between contents. But it has a lot more to say about gradient constraints on their relation. We also, contemporary technical tools allow us to formalize what we really mean by these gradient constraints. It's about the, pro condi it's, not, it's not just about probabilities of forms. It's about conditional probabilities of forms given the intended meanings and extrinsic constraints. This formalism revealed the weakness of the corpus data that we looked before, looked at, which they were suggestive but not conclusive. And we found actually the experimental data show that gradient conjoins likes is real, and actually it has a greater explanatory niche that reach than anybody ever thought in categorical models. Now, the very last moment I want to take to ask a higher level question. Once again, this is like the ultimate kind of question that linguists should be asking, why do the grammatical constraints look the way they do? And you know, there are a few different possibilities, I think, in this case. One is stylistic preference, one you might ask, but I, I consider this a failure of the second principle of um, not shoving data under the rug. Um, one might uh, appeal to psychological me mechanisms priming. I just want to speculate about one possible alternative here, um, which is a deeper source of explanation. So, um, this picture that I gave here before where if we know the meanings, we're holding them constant, treating them as absurd, and asking the relationship between these two variables, we actually have ignored one thing, which is where is the grammar in this picture? We're implicitly treating the grammar as certain. That is that the native speaker, uh, the participant in these judgments, knows it with perfect fidelity. But in reality, when you're using language, you actually have a lot of uncertainty about even the grammatical, about the grammatical information, the grammatical knowledge of your interlocutor. And so we can actually build that into the model. And we can say we can explicitly represent the grammar as an unobserved variable that you have some residual uncertainty about. This is also evidenced in the fact that people can adapt to speakers with different accents, with different styles, um, different kinds of diff frequencies of different grammatical constructions in real time very effectively. That is, this is something that's a moving target. And it turns out that in a wide variety of these hierarchical Bayesian models, it turns out that these kinds of uncertainties lead to predictions that more likely than not, even if the individual components said that these two things are independent, these two things will tend to look similar to each other on average when you average over the uncertainty of the grammatical form. Formally, you can see that by our independence criteria, and even without this arrow, these two things are now connected. They become dependent on each other, even though the individual component pieces of knowledge, they're independent. So, um, and I just want to throw that out as a speculation. Uh, I'm confident that the SOG tradition of precise formal claims, serious engagement with data, and rigor in assigning credit for distributional demonstrations will help us, of course, get to the bottom of this. Um, so thank you, Ivan. Maybe some of you may recognize this picture from a long time ago. Um, thank you. You made some questions. Do you want to say anything about the application of this to the classic case of parallelism um, being required, the coordinate structure constraint? And then maybe the strange Lakoff counterexamples to that that involve coordinating verb phrases. Oh, you mean yeah. not respected? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean that's uh, yeah. The, I think the answer to that that's a very good question. I think the answer to that is that those are exceptions to the generalization, right? So that, that's a case where the extrinsic constraints placed on the um, that's a case where the extrinsic complaint constraints placed on the context right of the coordination. Are not do not actually percolate down equally, and I, I mean my intuition. I think that's something that we need to look at more carefully. I think it's very clear that linear order plays a huge role in that, right? So a lot of those classic examples that um, you can't you can't arbitrarily reorder. You have to you know if you have an extra argument, it has to go in the most the most yeah. proximate case. So I, I think I mean I think that's a limitation of the categorical generalization that I stated at first. Yeah, that's a great question. You were saying that there's an interaction when the, when the meaning is held constant. And mm -hmm. so I was then stuck. I think I must have missed something right at the beginning of the story. If you have an example like instead of Kim was admired by Pat and by Sandy, you just get Kim was admired Pat and by Sandy. You can conjoin a noun phrase and a prepositional phrase, but assuming that the by is just a marker for the passive construction, you've got two entities whose meaning is the same, but that's a terrible sentence. Wait, so Kim was admired, Kim was admired Pat and by Sandy. But I that, I mean, the first by. I've conjoined an NP and a PP, but you've allowed me to do that, haven't you? 
Oh, well, sure. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But the extrinsic constraints are on that, or that you can't have a, you can't have an NP in that position. So those constraints percolate down, and they don't. They're not satisfied in each contract. So that's yeah, that doesn't work. I mean, that, that that's that's not a problem. Well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so oh, so the generalization. Okay, let's so let's go all the way back. The generalization is that. A, a coordination is categorically grammatical, and this is this is modulo Jeff's point, which I think th this is, that's outside of the scope of this generalization. If if and all if and only if it satisfies all the extrinsic constraints on its well formedness, the extrinsic constraint placed by Pat was admired is that the next thing cannot be a noun phrase, right? It has to be a prepositional. Well, well, it has to be a prepositional phrase. Well, it could be an adverb and so forth, but it can't be a noun phrase. Okay. And so that has to apply equally to the conjuncts. And that doesn't. I mean, and the first conjunct, Pat and by Sandy, does not satisfy that constraint, so that rules it out. Does that does that make sense? I don't know. By by Sandy and Pat, apparently, I found an example. But sorry, but by Sandy and Pat. Yes. Oh, but that's that. That's the NP's But that's the NP's Yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah. Could, could, you, could you run any simulation? Trying sure. to phrase it in terms of a production model. So the way is, imagine I'm trying to have a message. How would you look? Um, not in those terms, in terms of a production model, exactly what the producer is going to try to maximize. I, I can't get it. I mean, I get the, the formal part. I mean, I, how I, that I, translates into a production model. I mean, I, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the most useful way of thinking about the, the, the issue. Um, maybe we can talk about that offline. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. I mean, because presumably it's, it's produced, right? So you need to account for the production side. That oh, I see. Oh, oh, so here's one way of thinking about it. Here's some way, one way of thinking about it. When you actually produce, let's suppose that you have some, your, your representation of your grammar is actually, and this is a probabilistic grammar, right? So there's different, different, you have some probability on really liking pre-nominal genitives and really like, and another probability on really like post nominal genitives and a third probability on sort of being okay with either one, right? When you, pr when you speak, you're actually sampling a grammar, and then based on that grammar, you're producing both conjuncts, okay? So if you think about it that way, that will give rise to parallelism in production, even though if you don't explicitly represent the uncertainty in grammar, you don't, in fact, what you want is you want this representation without this, if you're not actually explicitly representing grammatical answer. There's no apparent, there's, the components are independent. But then when you bring in this higher order uncertainty level, that, that, that actually joins the two things together in the Does that, does that help? So I think we probably better uh, move on to the next feature. Yeah.